everyone. Welcome back to Diving Deeper, our series where we're taking a, a look at some difficult theological topics for those who are going through times of deconstruction and doubt and trying to find a deeper faith. Our current series is The Bible's Backstory, and we're looking at the history of the Bible, how we got to have this leather-bound, gilded edges book, and that there you know, actually is a backstory, a history to how that came to us today, that there were decisions that were made over time and are still made today in things like translation. You know, and that's one of the topics that we talked about in the first video, the manuscripts, the Greek and Hebrew that scholars use to try and recreate the original versions of what was written. And I don't know if I said this directly last time, but, you know, every English translation somehow is a commentary that there's never going to be a perfect translation because our knowledge of the ancient languages change. English or whatever language you speak changes, and so translations have to adapt as they go. And so what we're going to do today is look at a little bit of the history of specifically the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament and see how they developed in the writing process and then also the process of how they took the form, the canon, that we have today. So we're going to start with the Hebrew Bible or the Old Testament. Uh, if you're not familiar with that language, Hebrew Bible is generally preferred these days because it's more inclusive. Right? Jewish people that use it don't call it the Old Testament. Uh, that's really a Christian term, but um, Hebrew Bible kind of works for in both cases. Uh, I'll still say Old Testament sometimes, but uh, I just wanted you to know that. Now, we a lot of what we're doing in this series is just trying to examine some of these traditional assumptions that we have. It wasn't necessarily things that were taught to us, but it's just kind of what was assumed. And so one of those things is the idea that when things happened is when those events were written down. You know, because that's what we do. We're writing things all the time uh, with devices we carry in our pockets. But that's not how it was in the ancient world. It was an oral culture. Stories were handed on uh, for decades, maybe even centuries before they were written down at all. And then those writings uh, were also in process over a long period of time. And so that's the case with the Hebrew Bible. Now, it seems that the first five books, what's called sometimes the law, the books of Moses or the Torah, which is the Hebrew word for it, uh, that's kind of the central part of their scriptures. Um, you know, these legal codes and stories uh, about Moses or before, so that's why it's sometimes associated with him. Um, but actually, if you look, you just kind of read through it, the actual laws themselves really aren't mentioned much outside of you know those stories where they're given, supposedly, uh, until later on in the historical books, like during the reign of King Josiah. But the way that uh, the Hebrew Bible is uh, typically divided is in three sections. You have the law, the prophets, and the writings. Uh, so it's a little bit different than what you find in an English Bible. The prophets includes, you know, things like Kings and Chronicle, uh, sorry, Kings and Samuel. Uh, the writings includes all the other stuff. And actually, Chronicles is part of the writings, not the prophets. Uh, what we kind of see, though, through uh, history is that the Jewish people had really a renewed commitment to Scripture and having it written down after and during the Babylonian exile. You know, this is kind of the most pivotal crisis in the life of ancient Israel, where uh, the, their nation was destroyed, their leaders were taken away. And it seems like that's when there really was a focus on getting these books finalized. But even maybe it, during that period and, and before, there wasn't a lot of concern, it seems, of having a set canon of saying these books are definitely in and these are out. Right? Like I said, it did center around those five books uh, in the beginning. But as it goes on, it, it doesn't seem like they were focused a lot on saying this counts as scripture and this doesn't. Now, since these first five books are so important, I, I think this is a good place to focus on the process of how they were written and how they came to us. And so we're going to talk about something called the documentary hypothesis. Uh, this is a commonly accepted scholarly view. And really what it comes down to is about how Moses didn't actually write the books of Moses, the books that are attributed to him. Because there's a lot of evidence, both in, internal in the works themselves and externally, that points to that not being the case. 
Now, as far as external evidence goes, Genesis itself, the, this is the book we'll focus on a little more, it wasn't really attributed to Moses until much later, the Greco-Roman period. And yes, you do have Jesus in Mark 12 referring uh, to Exodus as the book of Moses, but that's a book where Moses is the main character of is actually uh, not as specific as some want to think. That doesn't mean inherently that Moses was the one who wrote it. But Moses writing these, these books is the traditional assumption, uh, but tradition is always something that you know, we want to take it seriously, but we also want to be willing to push back against it and acknowledge what is tradition, what is in the text. Because when we get to that internal evidence, what's in the text, well, the actual text of Genesis through Deuteronomy is anonymous. And in fact, most biblical books are. The titles that you'll see in your English Bibles, those come from tradition, not what is found in the, the manuscripts themselves. And the same for all the titles and headings and those sort of things, right? That's not the manuscripts. The manuscripts didn't even have verses. That's something that we added to help. And so, uh, for example, in Genesis, you find a lot of examples that seem to reflect a time period that's much later than Moses. So, for example, in chapter 12, uh, it says, at that time, the Canaanites were in the land, which implies, well, at this time, they are not. And Moses doesn't even enter the promised land, or he's not part of the conquest of the Canaanites when they would have uh, been removed. Um, so it sounds like that sounds like that's later, right? Uh, in chapter 14, it talks about the city of Dan, uh, but it wasn't renamed that um, until after the conquest, right? Dan is one of the tribes, so you wouldn't have a city named that uh, at that point in the story. Uh, in chapter 34 of Genesis, it uh, talks about Shechem did, had committed an outrage in Israel, which seems anachronistic, right? You're referring to Israel as a nation with customs, when at that point Israel was just another name for Jacob and his, his family. Uh, and throughout the letter, or throughout this book, you see repeatedly the phrase, to this day, which again sounds like later, when this nation is established. And so uh, the scholarly opinion, I always struggle with that word for some reason, I guess I'm not one, uh, is that there are probably four sources that went into these first five books and maybe even further into Samuel and Kings. And so uh, the first source is uh, called the Yahwist, or uh, J is how it gets abbreviated because uh, German scholars were influential here and, and they use that letter, not, not Y. Um, and so it's prob the, the Yahweh source, the J source, is probably the earliest. It reads more like folklore. Uh, and so it probably comes from during the time, uh, at least starting in the United Monarchy under uh, David and Solomon. Uh, this source probably originated in southern Judah. And so it's more favorable to David and the tribe of Judah in general. One of the ways that you can track these different sources is what names they will use for God uh, and or really when different names are used. Because in this source, uh, the reason it's called the Yahwist is because the divine name Yahweh is used from the beginning. Uh, and this source is mostly narrative. You find it in Genesis and Exodus. Another fairly early source is the Elohist or E. Uh, now, this source is probably from northern Israel, and so it's going to be more critical of King David. Uh, Israel, uh, the nation had a pretty strong north-south divide, just like in uh, American history. And so J David and Judah is in the south. The other tribes are in the north. That's going to shape whether they like David or not. Now, I mentioned the names. Uh, Elohist refers to Elohim, the uh, Hebrew word, general word for God, not the name of God. In this source, the divine name Yahweh is not revealed until uh, God reveals it to Moses in Exodus 6. So in this source, before that, it won't use that name. Afterwards, it will. Uh, and so it's also mostly narrative. It, it seems to start some with Abraham's story and go on from there. Another a third source is the priestly source. Um, uh, probably associated with the priests, as you might assume, uh, the Levitical priests. And it's very concerned with order, with clean or unclean. 
Uh, and so Genesis 1 probably comes from the priestly source, right? Because it's all about God creating order out of chaos. It has some narrative, but a lot of rules and laws as well. So the book of Leviticus is probably mostly from this source, right? So here you can see Genesis 1 is the priestly source. Genesis 2 is the Yahwist. And just seeing it's, you know, it's more folklore. You've got a, a talking snake, God coming down and walking in the garden. That, that fits that earlier view. And then the fourth main source is the Deuteronomist. Um, so Deuteronomy obviously uh, is part of this and also Samuel and Kings even going beyond uh, those first five books. And there's kind of a, a theology that's central here of cause and effect, that if you do good, you will be blessed. And if you do bad, you will be cursed. And it's very clear in Deuteronomy, Samuel and Kings seem to kind of be playing out by that, that storyline. And, um, you know, it seems to originate from the time of King Josiah uh, and then continues into the exile. And in a lot of ways is explaining why uh, the, the people went into exile because they didn't uh, follow the Lord as they were meant to. So this is probably a slightly later source. And so what happened at some point, probably during and then after the exile, an editor took these sources and put them together and was trying to retell Israel's story. And I think this helps explain why there are um, multiple accounts of the same event and that sometimes those accounts are telling it in different ways, right? Because it's from these different uh, traditions, these different uh, things that have been passed down by different families. So like I said, you have two creation stories that are very separate. But then in the flood, for example, you kind of get a, a mashup of the J source and the P source, right? So J just has two of every animal. Uh, P says, well, but there were seven of the clean animals, even though that also seems a little anachronistic because clean and unclean for proper sacrifice wasn't a concern yet because this is well before the time of the law. Uh, Abraham's covenant is told multiple times, like in Genesis 15 or 17, right, from those different sources. Uh, Sarah, Abraham's wife, getting passed off as his sister was in different sources, and so you get that story repeated. Uh, one of my favorites is the story of Joseph when he's being sold into slavery. This is in Genesis 37. Uh, it's also kind of combining the J and E source, it seems. And if you can uh, kind of separate those out, you can kind of, it makes more sense than what we actually have. We're used to just reading it as it is in our, our Bibles. Uh, and so things like, well, who sold Joseph into slavery, the Midianites or the Ishmaelites? Uh, was it Reuben or Judah that was trying to protect him? Right, you can separate those out. And in fact, a good source for this is uh, the Bible with sources revealed uh, by the scholar Richard Friedman. What he's doing here, he's trying to recreate which, uh, you know, it's just presenting the stories as they are, but they're color coded. So you can maybe kind of get an idea of what is what, um, you know, this is his guess, his attempt, right? There's no, it's not always abundantly clear which is which, but it does seem like there are different traditions that, that are put together. And this shouldn't trouble us too much because we already have four different accounts of the life of Jesus uh, that tell the story differently. And in a similar way, the early church decided they wanted to keep those different traditions instead of trying to, to harmonize them. And, you know, the, the editor of, of these, these traditions, you know, really more than an editor, he's trying to make sense of it. Um, but I think there's something important in this that they, whether it was one person or a group over time, they felt it was more important to keep sometimes contradictory traditions than to maintain a strict, consistent story. Right? The second is kind of what we would want or expect, or we would think that's what the Bible should do. But it was more important that they keep all of these stories that had been so formative for the people and handed down for who knows how long, even if they didn't always line up. Again, this is more of a modern concern that we get things completely consistent all the time. Uh, for them, they wanted to keep these stories because they found value in all of them. All right, why does this matter, um, whether you agree with this or not? Um, well, it tells us what the Bible is, right? This is part of what we're trying to do in this series and the previous story about bibliolatry, that we don't want to let our assumptions of how we think God should have given us a, a holy book of Scripture uh, overrule what seems to actually be happening in this book. Uh, as I've said before, God is letting the people tell the story. 
And it's also important for thinking about what situation are these books actually addressing? Is, you know, it's not trying to give objective history. I would say no biblical book is. The, the idea that that's what happens today is, uh, I think, maybe in question a little bit more, that it's always subjective somehow. But they're trying to speak to their time and their place. Um, and so what is that time or place? Well, is it Israel in the wilderness when Moses is leading them? That doesn't really seem like the best time to be writing these things down. Um, as I've said, the crisis of exile seems like it's the most significant. And so all of these works are trying to make sense of this so that God's people can live in the land as they are meant to and not make the same mistakes. Really, I think we need to see this idea of multiple traditions being edited together as a feature, not a bug. This isn't something that we have to explain away, either by saying, no, no, that's not true. It was all one writer at one point, and we know. Um, or saying that, no, there's no inconsistencies, or it, explain those away. The, these issues don't have to be issues. They don't have to be troubling or problematic. It doesn't mean that the Bible now is unreliable. Right? That's only the case if you've built up this idea that it has to be inerrant, which is not something that it claims. That's a modernist idea that's been, uh, we've tried, some people have tried to put on the Bible, and it can't bear that weight if you're being intellectually honest. I think acknowledging the Bible's backstory helps us appreciate what it is, appreciate the process of how it came to us. Yes, maybe it's a little messier than what we might have imagined or what we would prefer. I think that's a lot more interesting, and there's um, we can find more to appreciate in the book that was handed down to us. So here you can see a possible chronology of when the different books in the Hebrew Bible were written. And one of the things that uh, should be clear, as I've already kind of mentioned, that it seems like in most cases it wasn't one person at one point sitting down and writing out the whole thing but that these books had a longer process of being written and rewritten and edited over time. Like I said, the writing and the setting are very different, even though the traditional assumption kind of closes that gap. Uh, a good example of this probably to me is uh, the book of Daniel. It's set in the sixth century, the time of the exile, but it seems like it was probably written in, or at least finalized during the second century, uh, the Hellenistic or Maccabean period. And so it, it, it is about that time, and yet it's really trying to address uh, what was going on during the time of uh, situations in the second century. And there were some of the same issues. Of, are we going to give in to this empire? How do we maintain our traditions and our, our purity codes? During this, you know, when there's a lot of pressure against us, you know, it, it, it makes more sense of what was going on there. All right, so as we're kind of tracing the history of the Hebrew Bible, obviously it was originally written in Hebrew, that's why we call it that. But over time, there was a very important translation that was very formative for uh, Judaism and the early church. So uh, in about the third century BCE, uh, the Hebrew Bible was translated into Greek. Uh, Greek was becoming uh, the kind of dominant language around uh, the empire. And, you know, it was getting to where a lot of Jewish people knew Greek as well as, or maybe even better than Hebrew, or they were, you know, moving to the Aramaic dialect eventually. And so you get something called the Septuagint, uh, sometimes abbreviated to LXX, which is Roman numeral, Roman numeral for 70. Uh, because the legend behind the Septuagint translation is that there were 70 scribes who all went off on their own and translated the Hebrew into Greek, and all 70 copies were exactly the same. And I say that's a legend because uh, we know just from history and the manuscripts that we have that that's almost nearly impossible. I guess if you want to believe it's a miracle, then, then okay. Um, and so now what's more commonly used is this Greek version of uh, the Hebrew Bible, uh, what we call the Old Testament. Um, and they were including not just the books that we have in uh, most Protestant Bibles, uh, but there were other Hebrew writings from the time, uh, Jewish writings, I should say, that were written in Greek. Um, they weren't a Hebrew translation. 
And so this comes to be known later on as the Apocrypha, or the Deuterocanonical books. Now, by the time of the first century, so the life of Jesus and the early church, the Septuagint really is more commonly used in the Hebrew Bible, especially when you go outside of Judea, where a lot of Jews still were after the exile. And that's important for the New Testament because when New Testament writers quote uh, the Hebrew Bible, most of the time it seems like they were quoting from this Greek translation, not from the Hebrew. And so you can find certain uh, Old Testament references in the New Testament that don't really read exactly like the, uh, what you go back and, you know, if you found that reference in the Old Testament, one of the reasons very often is because they were translating uh, or they were using the Greek version. And so because there was kind of this starting to mix together what were the older Hebrew writings and some kind of newer Greek writings, we ended up with some books that, well, is it part of the canon or not, right? Is it really part of the Old Testament uh, or, or is it not? Uh, some, in some cases, it's just that the books are a little bit longer. And so there are Greek uh, additions to Daniel and Esther um, you have something like the prayer of Manasseh. So in Second Chronicles 33, the king prays, but it, then it seems like someone later came along and wrote that and uh, kind of put it in. And so these are the things, these books are what is known as the Apocrypha. Uh, it's a term that just means hidden. Uh, that's a term that is used by those who tend to not include them. Uh, those that do include them in their canon, in their Bibles, they refer to them as deuterocanonical, which just means like a secondary canon. Uh, so that would be like the Catholic Church, or Orthodox Christians, and others. Uh, but So they will use these books, but they consider them somehow secondary. Uh, the Apocrypha doesn't seem to show up in any New Testament books, but it is quoted by early church leaders, so they were clearly reading it. Um, and it was, it seems, in Christian Bibles uh, until the Protestant Reformation, uh, because the Reformers decided to only use those older Hebrew books. And I think we need to pause here and note the irony uh, that uh, those who proclaimed sola scriptura, scripture only, were also at the same time deciding what counts as scripture. You know, that sounds a little uh, like playing both sides there to me. Uh, and in fact, Martin Luther, one of those important reformers, he also even had opinions about what should be in the New Testament. He wanted to cut out uh, James, for example. So uh, the idea of scripture alone, right, already the people who were pu pushing that idea um, maybe were not being true to, you know, the history of what scripture had always been, uh, for a long time at least. Uh, I haven't spent a lot of time with the Apocrypha, but I appreciate the uh, Episcopal statement on them that they are to be read for example of life and instruction of manners, but not to establish any doctrine. Uh, you know, just for example, the Apocrypha is where we find the books of the Maccabees, and so that gives us the history of uh, their revolt against uh, an, an empire then. Uh, that's where the tradition of Hanukkah comes from. And so a lot of, uh, you know, at least the historical side of these books, is very important for knowing what goes on between uh, what's in the Hebrew Bible and what everybody knows and what people are doing by the time of the New Testament. But as we get to the New Testament, we also want to think about its chronology and authorship and how it developed over time, the order of the books. I, I think most people kind of know this, but maybe haven't thought about how, how significant it is that Jesus himself didn't write anything. You know, we would say he wasn't being a very good content creator or influencer, uh, but you know, he was just telling these stories, uh, these parables and other teachings and then they were going to be passed on orally, because again, it's more of an or oral culture. It seems like uh, from the Gospels that Jesus could read, uh, since we see him reading scripture in the synagogue at times. Um, so whether or not he could write, well, I don't know, uh, but he didn't think that was a necessary thing. So really, uh, historically or chronologically, the first Christian writer is Paul. Uh, he starts uh, writing letters probably in the 50s. Uh, to the churches that he's visiting or, or had visited or established. And then after those start getting written, then you start getting the Gospels written down and then other general letters and uh, books like Revelation. Uh, 
Uh, an important fact for this chronology is that both Paul and Peter were executed by the Roman Empire in the mid-60s. Uh, and so their writings, uh, anything they wrote, would have had to have come before then. Now, it's unclear at the time whether these writers, like Paul or John, uh, thought that they were writing more scripture, right? that they were writing the New Testament as we come to understand it. Um, it doesn't seem like that's the case for, for a lot of it. And, you know, although at the same time, Christians pretty quickly started copying and spreading these writings because they considered them useful in teaching about Jesus and, and telling some of these stories of his life. Uh, Paul himself seems to encourage it in Colossians 4. Now, uh, especially when we were talking about the Gospels, authorship is, again, sometimes unclear. All four Gospels are anonymous. It's tradition that links them to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, Hebrews is very clearly anonymous. At times it was linked to Paul, but it seems pretty clear that it's not from him. Um, Revelation, it does say it's written by John, but we don't know for sure which John that was, whether it's the apostle, the same writer as the Gospels and letters. Again, uh, this was an oral culture. Stories were handed down for a while before they got written down. And sometimes we have guesses as to what those sources may have been. For example, the Gospel of Mark uh, is uh, called by early church leaders the kind of by, uh, you know, records from Peter. Uh, so, you know, it maybe came from him, but that's, uh, again, a tradition. It's not in the text itself. Now, you can see here uh, a possible order for when these books were written. So, like I mentioned, uh, we see some of Paul's letters coming first, uh, and then you start to get Gospels, and then it's kind of mixed from there on. This is just a recreation. Um, you know, the, none of this is <laughs> set in stone by scholars. A lot of it is still debated. But one thing that is pretty important for these debates, and uh, you should be aware of, is that scholars dispute whether all of the letters that are attributed to Paul and Peter are actually by Paul and Peter, or if they were actually by some of their followers after their death, or they were written in their name. And again, this is a pretty big debate. It's not just, you know, extreme liberals that, that think this, but this is a pretty common uh, view that is debated within New Testament studies. So there are seven letters that are undisputedly from Paul, 1 Thessalonians, 1 Corinthians, and 2 Corinthians, uh, Galatians, Philemon, uh, Philemon, there's just one of them, uh, Philippians and Romans. But and then the disputed letters of Paul are 2 Thessalonians, Ephesians, Colossians, and 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. Uh, those last three are sometimes grouped, at, grouped as the pastoral letters. Uh, and then 2 Peter is very disputed. Uh, it's almost certainly not by Peter because of a, a few things like the um, him talking about the writings of Paul as if they are scripture, which again seems to be a later uh, idea. Uh, but 1 Peter as well is also disputed. Again, those uh, all those letters of Peter and Paul would have had to have been written uh, before the mid-60s when uh, they were executed. And, you know, I am aware that this is an idea that can be troubling to people, but in the ancient world, the idea of writing in someone else's name was a little more common, right? They didn't have our copyright uh, rules uh, and laws, and the idea of intellectual property wasn't um, as important or big. And so the term for this is pseudepigrapha, uh, which, I mean, it means false writing, so, you know, it sounds bad. But it was something that, that happened. It wasn't considered necessarily bad or deceitful. Now, the reasons why some of these letters are disputed, uh, one comes down to writing style. You know, that some letters seem like they have the same vocabulary and way of writing, and then others seem very different. Also, there seem to be different perspectives on certain issues, uh, things like uh, the role of women or marriage or leadership structures or even just when Jesus would return. Uh, early Pauline letters, uh, he seems to assume that it's going to be in his lifetime and then later that doesn't seem to be the view. Uh, books like 2 Timothy and 2 Peter, uh, their genre seems to be what was no, what's known as a final testament. 
right? It's kind of their last words um, as they know they're at the end of their life. That's a common pseudepigraphal genre. And, you know, the pastorals specifically, First and Second Timothy and Titus, they, they, they're written like their personal letters, right, to those two church leaders, but they definitely seem to read like they are for the whole church. And uh, some would argue, that, like I said, that pseudepigrapha was a common phenomenon during this period. So, for example, in the Apocrypha, you have something like uh, the Wisdom of Solomon. Uh, it's, it has Solomon's name on it, but it's very clearly from a much later time period uh, than Solomon, since it's written in Greek, which <laughs> I don't think even existed in Solomon's day. Or, or the uh, apocalyptic book of First Enoch, taking a character way back from Genesis, uh, right? So that's something that we see in other literature. Now, some counterpoints to this uh, dispute uh, is that, hey, you know what? Authors can write in different styles. Uh, there are modern authors that uh, do write in different genre, and that's okay. Uh, style develops over time. And also, uh, again, when we think writing, we think sitting, well, now it's sitting in front of a computer or, you know, me with my pen writing things out myself. In the ancient world, uh, most things were written down by a scribe. And so Paul would have been dictating his letter to someone and they were actually doing the writing. And so a possibility is that the scribes were doing more work than was assumed. You know, maybe sometimes the author didn't dictate every word, but gave the general idea. And then uh, the scribe was actually had, had a little more freedom than what we might assume. Um, a fun, uh, annoying trick that I like to play is to ask people who wrote Romans uh, and then turn to Romans 16.22. And you see that the answer to who wrote Romans is Tertius, um, because that seems to be the name of the scribe. And he put his little signature in there. And yet we would still say, well, actually, it's by Paul. He just wasn't doing the physical writing. Now, another counterpoint is that, you know, opinions change over time. Um, and I think this series is a pretty good example of the ways that, you know, what I'm presenting here isn't what I believed 10 years ago and maybe isn't what I'll believe 10 years from now. And that's that's OK. Changing your mind is a good thing. So how would Paul have responded pastorally if he did realize, you know what, maybe Jesus isn't going to come back right away. And so we need to get some things more established to last a little bit longer. Uh, another counterpoint is that there were no early church leaders who thought that these letters that are in dispute were uh, not from these apostles. And that's important because there are other works that are attributed to Paul or Peter that were rejected as, you know, they didn't write this. And so this isn't going to be part of the canon. Um, you know, and also it seems more common that pseudepigrapha was attributed to authors that were long dead, right? Like Solomon. Uh, it wasn't to either living people or people who had just died. Uh, ben Witherington, a scholar, says, you know, deceit is still deceit, even if it's for a, a spiritual purpose, a good purpose. And so I, you know, I'm not settled on a lot of these, um, but it's a debate that we should be aware of. And again, the question of well, why does it matter? Well, again, it's just like with uh, Genesis or those early Hebrew books. What situation is this letter addressing? You know, we never know for sure. But that helps us understand, you know, what it's speaking to helps it speak better to us now. Uh, it's not about whether we're going to read these books. We're not going to cut them out of the Bible. It's just affecting how we read them. I think, again, there's an irony here where those who would argue the most strongly against anything being not by these traditional authors, well, those people tend to also believe that it was dictated word for word by the Holy Spirit. So the human author shouldn't matter at all, right? Um, you know, we're, we're talking here some about, and this is where we're going to go next time, uh, what counts as the canon? Now, canon is that term for what is uh, in the Bible and what is not. Canon is really connected to what has been formative for the church throughout its lifetime. And if these books have been formative, regardless of, you know, who actually did the writing, well, then we can't just cut it out. All of them have been influential in some way, uh, some more than others. You know, we're going to talk about that as well next time. But we don't get to just start cutting things out for whatever reason. 
And on the other side, if we somehow manage to find a long lost letter of Paul, and you know, for the sake of this argument, we just have to say we know that it's him somehow, we're not going to add that to the canon. It's not going to start, you're not going to reprint the Bibles and put this letter in there because it hadn't, it wouldn't have been influential to the church through all of its lifetime. It would probably be worth reading, uh, but it wouldn't achieve that status because it hasn't had that meaning over time. So next time, like I said, we're going to talk about the canon, about what was or wasn't included and why those choices were made, but to see that choices were made. There was not a divinely given table of contents to say these are the books that, in, that are in and these are the ones that are out. That was something the church worked through and that understandably can make us nervous, but we want to be honest and uh, think about that process and see how we got the Bible that we have today. So thanks for joining me today. We'll see you next week for more diving deeper on the Bible's backstory. Thank you.